Welcome to Physical Chemistry 2. In the thermodynamics part of the course, we will first look at phase equilibria and at uh, the clausius clapeyron equation. Let's jump straight in. So, um, in this week, we will begin our study um, of phase equilibria with some general considerations. Yeah, and then we will, with Gibbs phase rule, we will then learn about the relationship between the number of phases, the number of components, and the number of freely selectable variables. Yeah? And after that, uh, we will then deal with uh, phase equilibria and one component systems, yeah? the most simple of model systems. And we will, in this context, discuss, uh, discuss the uh, clausius clapeyron equation. And what these weird names actually stand for in practice. So the, uh, uh, the systems that we will consider initially are closed systems. Yeah, never mind whether they contain solids, liquid, gases. Well, not so common in chemistry, but still possible with, to describe with these equations other than plasmas. Yeah. So we know that in a closed system we get to thermal equilibrium only. Yeah, when the entropy has reached a maximum value. Yeah, and what does that mean? The moment that entropy has reached a maximum value, it doesn't change anymore, so we get ds equals zero. Yeah, and in physical chemistry one, we also saw that uh, entropy can be described as a function of temperature. So here's our temperature term and pressure. Yeah, so ds is equal to Cp over T times dt minus V times alpha dp. Yeah, so here is the uh, pressure related term and that is the temperature related term with CSR heat capacity. Yeah. So now uh, imagine for a moment if we had uh, areas of different temperature or pressure within such a closed system, yeah, then we would uh, start uh, an irreversible balancing process. Yeah. And this would inevitably be linked to an increase in entropy. Yeah. But we already said we are at thermal equilibrium yeah, and, and we are in a closed system. So we can uh, categorically say uh, here uh, the following statements in equations 3.3 and 3.4. Yeah, so that as we go through our system at different positions dash, double dash and triple dash, the temperature will be equal in all of these positions and the pressure will also be equal at all of these positions, yeah, where the dashes indicate different positions within our system. Yeah, further, we know uh, that if we keep uh, pressure and temperature constant, yeah, the equilibrium condition in a closed system is then given here by this equation, yeah, dg at constant pt is equal to uh, equal zero, yeah, so uh, uh, this, this energy doesn't change anymore. And uh, further, yeah, if we consider constant volume and temperature, then we can say dA at constant uh, Vt is equal to zero. Yeah, and here dA is essentially the change in free energy. Yeah, so from this, uh, from all of this, we find so far, yeah, that the change in the free enthalpy of our system per mole of substance, yeah, mu also equal to our chemical potential is also the same at different positions in the system. Yeah. So it means uh, mu dash is the same as mu double dash is the same as mu triple dash. Yeah? And you remember this definition from previous lectures. Mu yeah, um, is here our change in the free uh, enthalpy yeah? per delta n yeah? the, uh, per mole of our substance. All right. Um, so, okay, where were we? So, most importantly, um, from all of these equations here, so the ones here at the bottom, 3.3, 3.4, and 3.7, yeah, we find that it doesn't matter uh, um, whether the different areas belong to one phase or whether they represent different phases, yeah, simply because these conditions have to hold true, yeah. And we will see on the following slides, um, pretty much, that we can derive all phase equilibria with uh, the requirement contained here in equation 3.7, yeah? provided that we carefully consider uh, temperature, pressure, 
and uh, concentration dependence here of our uh, chemical potential mu. So this brings us to a Gibbs phase rule. It's named after Josiah Willard Gibbs. Yeah, so he was an American scientist working at Yale and he was working there on applications of thermodynamics and this forms to this day the core of material science. Yeah, and he created together with Maxwell and Boltzmann the foundations of statistical mechanics. Yeah, and uh, well that said, uh, Gibbs uh, was pretty much an unsung hero during his time and this was partly due to his work being published in quite obscure journals and he also seemed uh, to have uh, done his best to write in a particular draw very incomprehensively. Yeah, so if you ever look up some of his original face diagrams, uh, they look fairly esoteric. So it took quite a while for the rest of uh, the scientific community to really appreciate Gibbs' work. Uh, but we'll try to do that now in a speed run. Yeah? So let's try to deconvolute Gibbs' findings. Yeah? So uh, Gibbs deduced, uh, as I said, these um, phase rules. Yeah? And this is an extremely well, simple rule or set of equations. And we'll try to look at how he, how he arrived there. Uh, so let's define our thermodynamic system that we'll be looking at. And uh, essentially, um, the system will co uh, will consist either of one yeah, or several phases, which we will label P. Yeah, and by phase we mean a range within which no abrupt changes of any physical quantity occur. Yeah, but well, obviously at the boundary of these phases we will then be observing such changes. Yeah, and there is a handy definition right here. So a phase is a region of space where all physical properties, yeah, for example, density, hardness, chemical composition uh, of a material are essentially uniform. Okay, so in addition, uh, the system is composed either of one or several components K. Yeah? And by the component, we understand the minimum number of independent chemical constituents yeah, that we need to produce uh, a phase. Okay, now the state of the entire system is described by a number of state variables, yeah, depending on the nature of the system. And um, by freedoms f, uh, we understand the number of state variables yeah, that we can vary independently without causing any of the phases to disappear. Yeah? So we, by phase variables, what do I mean? Yeah, pressure, temperature, molar composition can be uh, uh, other principal ones, yeah? and we already knew them. So um, essentially, uh, uh, by freedoms f, yeah, uh, we understand the number of these uh, possible values for p, t, and mu, for example, yeah, that we can vary without uh, making any of the phases disappear. Yeah. Now, um, maybe this bit I'll probably write down there. Um, so, in order to uh, uh, define each phase uniquely, yeah, we need to specify. Uh, so, for each phase, we need to specify uh, pretty much the pressure, um, temperature, and well, the mole fraction of all the different components, right? So mole fractions. And now we might have K number of different components. Yeah, so we essentially have X1, X2, all the way to XK, yeah? Now, if we sum up all of these mole fractions, so essentially, uh, sum over all i's, yeah? it's clear what do we get? Well, we get the entire phase. Yeah? So that would sum up to 1. So that means uh, we only have to specify k minus 1 mole fractions. Yeah? Because the other one has been clear. This has been the entire phase. OK? So we need only these uh, k minus one mole fractions, yeah, to uniquely define the composition of a phase. Yeah, so for, for each phase, we must therefore specify, yeah, as I said, p, t, and k minus one mole fractions. Yeah, so that's a total of 
k plus one variables yeah to specify k so and the and these this is the consideration that goes into the total number of system variables yeah so we need p times k plus one uh, we have uh, p times k plus one total number of system variables yeah so we have a number uh, a, any number of phases and each phase is, to, uh, is fully characterized by k plus one variables all right so this gives us equation 3.8 yeah and now due to the equilibrium conditions yeah, that we listed on the previous slide there are a number of relationships between these variables yeah? and this is given here again uh, uh, by equations 3.3 3.4 and 3.7 yeah so um, so these equilibrium conditions must be satisfied yeah for each molar fraction yeah one two three all the way up to k yeah so this will give us uh, uh, so each of these terms has a total of p minus one terms yeah and we have to do this for all the molar fractions yeah one two three four five up to k yeah so that means the total number of equilibrium conditions yeah will then be k plus two times p minus one yeah all right so uh, the number of freedoms yeah and this is now now we come essentially to gibbs findings so the number of freedoms f is then obviously the difference between the total number of variables yeah um uh, sorry uh, the total number of variables yeah and the minus the total number of equilibrium conditions yeah so it means f equals p times k plus one yeah minus k plus two times p minus one okay and this will oh this should be a capital p here sorry about that anyway um so uh, and this will give us essentially f equals k minus p plus two yeah so this here equation 3.10 um so this re important relationship here is called gibbs phase rule yeah and we call uh, then systems differently depending on the number of degrees of freedom within yeah so with f equals zero we have an invariant system yeah with e f equals one with a univariant system and with f equals two a divariant system and we'll see later what other uh, degrees of freedom uh, um, a thermodynamic system can have so what does the uh, gibbs uh, phase rule mean in practice yeah let's look at this uh, uh, with an example and i'll pick here carbon steel yeah so carbon steel or uh, is usually our normal steel yeah as we know it and uh, it consists of pure iron and at most uh, two percent of pure carbon yeah so um, that means it consists of uh, two components yeah iron and carbon and thus uh, we have k equals two yeah that's why we call it a binary system yeah? if we would look now at real steel yeah we might we might have far more components than just these two yeah so we would have in addition to iron and carbon we might also find the manganese silicon and nickel yeah so we might get all the way up to five or more depending on how uh, refined or dirty the steel actually is yeah now since gibbs phase rule uh, applies to any system yeah we keep in mind yeah that there is essentially no limit on components yeah so now what about the phases now that's going to be already a little bit more tricky yeah so there are a number of possible phases in our system yeah so uh, we could get bcc iron yeah with some dissolved carbon yeah it's it's ferrite uh, we could get fcc yeah face centered iron with some dissolved carbon yeah and this is uh, austenite yeah we could also get hexagonal iron with some dissolved carbon yeah this is not strictly forbidden but doesn't really exist yeah we could also get liquid iron carbon yeah or uh, cementite yeah this would be iron free carbon uh, or any other well-defined uh, iron carbon com uh, compounds yeah fex cy yeah they should in principle exist but they are not really observed yeah or we could get 
uh, vice versa, carbon with some dissolved iron in it. Yeah, does exist, but it's usually not found. Yeah, and whatever else uh, you can make with, with make with iron and carbon. Yeah, so in other words, uh, knowing the number of components doesn't necessarily tell you how many phases you might find in your system. Yeah, now you get. Uh, essentially the first idea why the concept of, uh, of phases can get a bit confusing at times. Yeah, So um, let's leave now P open for now, Yeah, because this is essentially where Gibbs phase rule will help us out later. Okay, now to get to the number of freedoms, yeah, we also have a problem. Yeah, So let's consider uh, yeah, that we do something to our system first. Yeah, We might, for example, lower the temperature, increase the pressure yeah, or change the composition. Yeah, so change the uh, composition of carbon to iron in some in some way yeah by adding more carbon or taking some carbon away uh, we could also add a magnetic field yeah or whatever so the point uh, um, marking the state of a system yeah in some phase diagram yeah then moves to a different position and we get a different system yeah but also do we also get different phases yeah and this is the big question uh, that gibbs phase rule uh, will answer yeah so of course we already know parts of this answer. Yeah, if you start uh, with a one-phase system, yeah, liquid carbon steel. So we just plug in uh, P equals one for now, and yeah, and then decrease the temperature. Yeah, our liquid uh, um, liquid carbon steel will eventually freeze. Yeah, and then you have changed the phase. Yeah. However, if it is uh, hot enough, yeah, when you start, you can essentially change the temperature, the pressure, and the comp composition to some degree, yeah, and you will still have the same phase, yeah, namely your liquid steel. So, so we have obviously three degrees of freedom, F, yeah, or three variables that we can use to play um, to play with our system, yeah, without changing the phases. It consists of yeah but this again applies only if the phase that we start out with is already hot enough yeah on the other hand if a system happens to be right at the boundary let's say yeah between the liquid and the solid then you can't change the temperature yeah without producing either pure liquid or pure solid yeah this is clear at least one degree of freedom is then lost yeah so we would get to uh, f equals two so this is essentially the point uh, uh, where Gibbs came in. So let's give this a go. Yeah, for our model system, essentially we found we've got two components. Yeah, so k equals two, and uh, the sum of the number of phases. Yeah, and degrees of freedom is then equal to p plus f equals four. Yeah, following here our expression, f equals k minus p plus two. Yeah, so we essentially plug in our 2 here into this equation 3.10. So we get then f equals 2 minus p plus 2. Yeah, uh, solve for, so get all the uh, variables f and p onto one side. So we get p plus f equals 4. Right? So far, so clear. Good. So that gives us uh, um, essentially the following options for our two component system yeah so we get essentially now here uh, um, depending on the number of phases yeah if we have one phase we've got three degrees of freedom we've got if we've got two phases we will get uh, um, two degrees of freedom three phases one degree of freedom and four phases we've got zero degrees of freedom yeah so the possible variables as we know are temperature pressure and our composition So now the first interpretation yeah, of this equation p plus f equals 4 yeah, for p equals 1 um, is very simple. Yeah? So for example, if we have just one phase, yeah, uh, for example, liquid steel or ferrite, then we can change all of these three variables, t, p and the composition, and we will still have only one phase, yeah? namely that of whatever we started out with, liquid steel or ferrite. Yeah, of course, if we change the variables, yeah, we move into another point, yeah, and this will be in a three-dimensional phase diagram, where where these variables p, t, and composition define the axes. Yeah, 
The system is then essentially characterized by a point in this phase diagram. Yeah, and as we change the variables, the point moves to some other place inside a volume yeah, that characterizes the particular one phase state. Yeah? So if we change the variables a lot, we will eventually reach some sort of boundary. Yeah? And this will be essentially the validity range of this Gibbs phase rule. Yeah? So three-dimensional phase diagrams with uh, uh, pressure uh, uh, P as a third axis yeah, are in use, and we will see one later. Yeah, they are just not very practical to draw, yeah, as long as we keep the pressure constant in particular, which is usually the case for chemical reactions. Yeah? And this is why we usually uh, give two-dimensional phase diagrams. Yeah? Here with temperature um, uh, T yeah, and the composition as axes. Yeah? So in other words, assuming that the pressure is constant, yeah, which again is a very valid assumption for most uh, chemical reactions, yeah, then uh, we reduce the maximum degrees of freedoms by one. Yeah? At P equals constant, the maximum number of degrees of freedoms is reduced by one. Yeah? So it means Gibbs phase rule yeah, then, then reduces to uh, P plus F equals C plus one. Yeah? And we end up here with our second table. Yeah? So let's look at the relevant uh, phase diagram for our system yeah, to see what that means. Yeah? So the colored dots here represent some specific state of our system. Yeah? So we can be either inside an area on, on one of the lines uh, or in a point where the lines meet, yeah, like here, for example. So let's go through, through all these options. Yeah? So if we are inside an area, yeah, we could be either inside a single phase or inside a mixed phase area. Yeah, what we get is then absolutely clear here. So uh, let's start out here with this blue dot. Yeah, so we, get, we are here essentially in a single phase area. Yeah, we have P equals one. Yeah, and hence we get F equals two. Yeah, so that means we can change the composition and the temperature. Yeah, remember that we keep pressure constant. Yeah, so that we, from this equation, we essentially uh, automatically uh, eliminate one degree of freedom. So we've got two degrees of freedom. Yeah, so at constant pressure with one phase, we've got two degrees of freedom. So we can change the composition and the temperature and we are still in the same phase. Okay, now let's look at a uh, well, here is two phase area. So here we've got a phase gamma and a phase L. Yeah, whatever this is, it's just an example. Um, so this is a green dot here in this yellow area. So we've got two phases. Yeah, so P equals two. So here we are here in our table, and we've got uh, one degree of freedom. Yeah. So indeed, uh, since we have a structure decomposed into two phases on the left and right of the tie line. Yeah? Uh, we can either change the temperature yeah, when the new composition is given and not independent, or we can change the composition yeah? and when the temperature of this composition is given and not independent. Yeah? So that's why only one degree of freedom. Now let's consider this purple dot here. Yeah? So here we are essentially at the boundary between three phases. Yeah? So we've got P equals three, yeah? and hence we've got no degrees of freedom. Yeah? It means it's not an area, it's a point, yeah? and you can't change anything. Otherwise you essentially lose uh, this, yeah, this, po this position. Yeah? So everything is fixed. So three phases essentially can only coexist at one single point and a binary phase diagram. Yeah? Um, so this is the case here yeah, for these violet, violet uh, dots. So what about four phases? Yeah, will we get that? So if we had four phases, uh, P would uh, equals four. Yeah? And following our equation here, F should be minus one. Yeah? And that simply means it can't be done. Yeah? So you can never have four phases coexisting in a system of just two components yeah, when, it, when it's in equilibrium. All right. 
So let's uh, now apply Gibbs phase rule to a um, second example, yeah, second special case, um, where chemical reactions are essentially allowed to occur between the constituents. Yeah? And this may give, give rise again to new substances, so it means new components. Yeah? So again, we've got one or several phases P, yeah? but in addition, yeah, we've got uh, a total of n different substances, yeah? some of which are in chemical equilibrium with each other. Yeah? So accordingly, you have a total number of variables in this system is P times n plus 1. Yeah? The same, same considerations apply as for physical phase transitions that we've done last on the last slide. Yeah, and the total number of phase equilibrium conditions yeah, uh, is given then by n plus 2 times p minus 1. Yeah? And uh, since we are now dealing with chemical equilibria, yeah, we also have uh, a number r yeah, of chemical equilibrium conditions. Yeah? So this is the phase equilibrium conditions that we saw previously, and we, we are also confined by a number of independent chemical equilibrium conditions, depending on the substances that we use. So let's illustrate that um, with an example. Yeah, so uh, here we have our example uh, of a system that contains hydrogen, chlorine, bromine, HCl, HBr and BrCl. Yeah, so we have a total of uh, n equals 6 substances. Yeah. So then uh, between these substances, yeah, we can essentially uh, formulate three independent reaction equations. Yeah. So H2 plus Cl2 is in equilibrium with uh, 2HCl. H2 plus Br2 is in equilibrium with 2HBr. Br2 plus Cl2 is in equilibrium with 2BrCl. Yeah. So we can also set up further reactions, yeah, but they can all essentially be traced back to to one uh, uh, from from these three, yeah. So they are not counting towards uh, the total number of independent chemical equilibrium conditions, yeah. So here, for example, HCl plus HBr is an equilibrium with H2 plus BrCl, yeah. We can formulate that, but that is effectively equation 317 here, yeah minus equation 315 minus equation 316 yeah and all of this times a half so that would that would balance out so we essentially reconstitute this entire equation from the three basic uh, um, equilibrium conditions given above yeah the same applies here for cl2 plus hbr is an equilibrium of 2 hcl plus br2 yeah so that is essentially it might be a little bit easier to see. So it's essentially equation 3.15, yeah, minus equation 3.16. So if we tried that, yeah, we would essentially eliminate our hydrogen, yeah, we would get Cl2 on one side, Br2 on the other, 2HCl on one side minus uh, 2HBr on the other, and we swap it around because we can't have uh, negative components in chemical equilibrium, we would get this equation. Okay, so um, so we would get uh, in total yeah n equals six. Number of independent chemical equilibrium conditions would be three, yeah, and uh, we would also get k equals three, yeah. So we can then plug all of this into our considerations of the numbers of freedom, yeah. So here we have essentially f equals n minus r minus p plus 2. Yeah, this is an analogy to what we described above, yeah, only that we also now con consider the independent chemical equilibrium conditions. So if we all plug this in, yeah, we essentially get f equals 6 minus 3. Yeah, so this is this bit. Yeah, 6 for n, 3 for r, yeah, minus p. So the amount of phases is still the unknown. Yeah plus 2. Yeah? Or if we separate out the var variables and the constants, we get p plus f equals 5. So let's now consider the most uh, basic case of phase equilibrium. And that's essentially one component system. Yeah? So we've got uh, 
one component, one phase. Yeah, and if we apply a phase rule um, to such a system, yeah, we can see that we have a maximum number of freedoms when there is only one phase present. Yeah, so we essentially get with k equals one and p equals one, we get f equals two. Yeah, so it's a divariant system. Um, what this means is, yeah, that from the three variables, p, t, and volume, we can choose two freely. Yeah, the third then follows inevitably from the equation of state. Yeah, and we saw this in action. Yeah, uh, when we are considering ideal gases, this is essentially encapsulated in the ideal gas law, p v equals n r t. Yeah, so it means. A one component system, yeah, it can also consist of two phases, yeah, for example, a solid and a liquid. Yeah, and according to a phase rule, uh, there is then only one degree of freedom. Yeah, this means that if we freely choose P or V or T, yeah, the other two state variables are fixed. And as a third case, uh, we still have to discuss the existence of three phases, yeah, and according to our phase rule, such a system would be invariant, yeah, so f equals zero. That means no state variable can be chosen freely anymore, yeah. And the figure here now shows us uh, the surface of states, yeah, also called the PVT diagram, yeah, uh, for a one component system. Yeah, now the dotted lines uh, pretty much represent isotherms, yeah, so at same temperature. Um, and uh, these are essentially intersection curves yeah, between the state surface and the planes. Yeah? And these planes are then parallel to the PV plane. Yeah? So for temperatures uh, that are noticeably above the critical temperature, yeah? um, the, so the state area then corresponds yeah, to that of an ideal gas. So PV equals NRT then applies. Yeah? And we've discussed uh, the significance of these states, yeah, for example, uh, in the, uh, when we're looking at steel, yeah, for P equals constant. Yeah? And finally, we can see from this figure uh, also that there is one temperature here denoted as TT, yeah, at which we um, have a solid, liquid and a vapor phase in equilibrium. Yeah, and the middle section yeah, of this isotherm is called the, the triple state. Yeah, it imposes a, a certain pressure yeah, and a certain molar volumes yeah, for solid, liquid and vapor. Yeah, so this is also the state of invariance of a system. Yeah, what this means is the moment that we deviate from this only a little bit, yeah, immediately uh, we are moving away from a free phase system. Okay, um, so let's now conclude the uh, considerations of these three-dimensional state surfaces yeah, and let's turn uh, um, to the treatment of phase equilibria in two-dimensional uh, representations, yeah, because these are the ones that we can actually sketch on paper. Yeah, and here we're choosing the uh, PT representation. Yeah, so in the PT projection, um, this triple state line, yeah, be logically becomes a point. Yeah, because we keep uh, essentially the vo uh, volume fixed. Yeah. And all the uh, two-phase regions, which we saw previously, they become lines. Yeah? And if we exceed one of the equilibrium curves, yeah, so these lines, yeah, due to a change in pressure or temperature, then uh, the initial phase disappears yeah, and a new phase is created. Yeah? So if we have a two-phase system, we must be on one of the lines. Yeah? So if we are beyond the line, it's just one phase. For here, it's also only one phase. If we're moving along one of these lines, uh, we have a two-phase two system. And we, when we're at this triple point, yeah, then we have this exclusive case of three phases existing simultaneously and in equilibrium. Yeah? So if we want to maintain this uh, um, two-phase system, despite a change in pressure or a change in temperature, 
yeah when we have simultaneously uh, we must also adjust the temperature or the pressure yeah so if we're moving along any of the given lines so if we have a phase alpha yeah an equilibrium with a phase beta uh, then following must apply for the chemical potential yeah we must have mu alpha equals mu beta yeah remember our definitions of a system previously yeah uh, and essentially again mu uh, is the change in the free enthalpy of our system per mole of substance yeah also the chemical potential so that gives us equation 3.18 yeah so along the, the curves yeah along these lines then uh, we see in the figure as we change the temperature yeah uh, uh, we know that mu is temperature dependent yeah so we need that equation 318 holds not only true at a given temperature but at all temperatures yeah and this is the case when the change in d mu alpha yeah is the same uh, as d mu beta yeah in the chemical potential in the beta phase so this gives us 3.19 yeah um, now we also know um, that mu is identical yeah with a molar free enthalpy yeah uh, so we can use one of the characteristic functions yeah that you might have seen uh, already in physical chemistry one yeah to substitute into this equation yeah we will circle back to these characteristic functions later so if you don't remember those anymore where they came from we'll come back to that okay uh, uh, but anyway right so for now um, uh, we know again to restate that mu is identical with a molar free enthalpy yeah uh, so we substitute that in and we get a fairly complex looking relationship here in 3.20 yeah um, so don't be shocked yeah this is essentially our characteristic function here yeah for the alpha and beta phases that's it yeah so we essentially see uh, the dg terms yeah represented here so these are these relationships so these are the dg terms at constant pressure yeah and at constant uh, temperature hang on i think i've got yeah um, so they are here circled in red uh, we also have uh, the entropy uh, term so this is minus sdt yeah here in orange so these are those and we've got the volume terms yeah so vdp terms in green yeah so that's it that's the same as a characteristic function up there only expressed for the equilibrium of phases alpha and beta yeah that's it okay uh, so now what okay right so we essentially we can summarize uh, um, the terms uh, dt yeah that we have here and dp um, and uh, if we do that we essentially obtain here equation 3.21 yeah for coexisting phases yeah and uh, here we essentially substituted um, as beta uh, as beta and uh, as alpha yeah so this difference as beta minus as alpha is a difference of the molar entropies of a substance yeah in the two phases yeah and uh, v beta minus v alpha is a difference of molar volumes yeah so in the context um, of a problem set yeah and or, or and real life quantities um, we would essentially plug in for s beta minus s alpha uh, we would plug in the entropy of melting yeah or the entropy of, evapor of evaporation uh, or the entropy of sublimation yeah and for uh, delta v uh, we would get the change in molar volume that, that accompanies melting, evaporation, or sublimation. Yeah. So uh, since there is an equilibrium yeah, between the two phases alpha and beta, um, this is uh, um, this process, whether it's melting, evaporation, or sublimation, will be also reversible. Yeah. So we may therefore 
express the entropy delta s yeah, of this transformation. Uh, we can express this by the amount of heat converted. Yeah, so this is the uh, this term here Q reversible, yeah, which is identical to the change in molar enthalpy, yeah, delta H. All of this at constant pressure, yeah. So now we can combine uh, this expression for the entropy, yeah, of, tr of the transformation delta S from equation 3.21, yeah, and the expression for delta S here from equation 3.22. And we get yeah, the Clausius Clapeyron equation. Yeah? So this is essentially delta P over delta T yeah, at coexistence equals delta H divided by T times delta V. Yeah? So finally, we have our equation with a cumbersome name. Yeah? And this is uh, related to these two gentlemen here. Rudolf Clausius and Benoit Clapeyron. Yeah? So they gave their names to the uh, Clausius Clapeyron equation, and it was Clapeyron's work yeah, on the reversible processes that allowed him to make substantial extensions to uh, Clausius' work, yeah, including this formula above. And we saw in the previous slides yeah, that this formula characterizes <coughs> excuse me, the phase transition between two phases of matter. Right? So uh, it is noteworthy yeah, that this equation also directly gives us the slope yeah, um, along the equilibrium lines. Yeah? So this expression here, delta P over delta T at uh, coexistence, yeah, will describe the slope along these uh, equilibrium lines as we, as, we are, as we drew them in here. Yeah? So uh, we start with a comparison uh, of this uh, sublimation pressure curve yeah, and the vapor pressure curve. Yeah? So as we cross yeah, for, uh, this curve at the same temperature, so let's pick a temperature here, yeah, here for example, as we cross um, uh, at the same temperature, yeah, we move from a condensed phase yeah, to a vapor phase. Yeah? So now the molar volumes of solids and liquids, for example, yeah, they differ only slightly. Yeah? But both are smaller by three orders of magnitude than the molar volume of vapor of, of a vapor phase. Yeah? So uh, this is what we find here in the observation yeah, from the phase diagram one. Yeah? V solid is approximately equal to V liquid. Yeah, but they are both much, much smaller than uh, V of vapors. Yeah, so I think like just as an example, one centimeter cubed of pure carbon is exactly one mole of carbon. Yeah, and uh, if you promoted all of these carbons into the uh, into the gas phase, yeah, you would get your 21.4, 20, sorry, 22.4 liters. Yeah, still with the same mole. So this is essentially encapsulated here. Okay, um, so uh, um, so we find uh, therefore, yeah, the delta V in the sublimation process, yeah, and in the evaporation process is nearly equal to the molar volume of a vapor phase. Yeah, so as we uh, so the changes in volume, yeah, which we observe for melting, yeah, delta melting, uh, delta V melting is much much smaller than delta V vaporization, yeah, or delta V sublimation, yeah. So this is essentially here in uh, in relationships two. So now if you want to express, yeah, the vapor pressure, P. As a function of temperature, yeah, using the clausius clapeyron uh, equation, we have to integrate this equation. Yeah? So two difficulties arise here. First, neither delta H yeah, nor delta V is independent of temperature. Yeah? And as a consequence, delta H and delta V are zero here at this triple point. Yeah? So, however, if we are far enough yeah, from this critical point, yeah, like in these points here, given in orange, um, then as we have seen from point one, 
yeah, delta V for sublimation and for the evaporation process is practically equal to the molar volume of a gas pressure. Yeah, sorry, of a gas phase. Yeah. So now um, we can look at the uh, at a very narrow temperature range. Yeah, with dT uh, going towards zero. Yeah, and then we can consider also delta H. Yeah, as an independent variable. Yeah, independent of temperature. And now we can apply the uh, ideal gas law. Yeah, so then we get essentially here our equation 3.24. Yeah, so if uh, we just consider uh, uh, tiny variations in temperature, so dt goes against zero. Yeah, then we get delta V equals approximately to Vd, yeah, which is the molar volume of a gas phase. Yeah, so we get our delta V equals RT over P expression here according to the ideal gas law. Yeah, and we can combine this now uh, uh, with our clausus clapeyron equation. Yeah, so plug in here our delta V um, and we get our equation 3.25. Yeah, so it's delta P over delta T at coexistence equals delta H times P over RT squared. Yeah, so here essentially we only substituted uh, delta V from our clausus clapeyron equation by RT over P. Yeah, so we get this relationship here in 3.25. Okay, so now we can separate out variables. Yeah, and we get equation 3.26. Yeah, so it's delta L and P over delta 1 over T in coexistence equals minus delta H over R. Yeah, and now this is uh, uh, one of these equations that we can integrate easily and we'll see that on the next slide. So from indefinite integration uh, we get equation 3.27 here. Yeah, so this is our log. Here some uh, a fraction and a constant. Yeah, um, and a more applicable case when for given values t1 and t2 is given here in equation 3.28. Yeah, it's uh, the log uh, of pressure at temperature 2 over uh, pressure at temperature 1 equals delta H over R times in brackets 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2. Yeah, so these are essentially the starting and uh, uh, starting temperature and the temperature we're going to. Yeah, and um, there are numerous iterations in literature of these equations. Yeah, and the one here above. It's called the August equation, but I mean, you don't need to remember that. I just want to, you to observe a couple of points. Yeah. So from these uh, uh, equations, yeah, the most important thing to take away is that the uh, log of uh, um, pressure yeah, is essentially a linear function um, of 1 over t. Yeah. This is important. This is significant. Yeah. Note, though, uh, we have an index S here, yeah, and S indicates uh, that this is the equilibrium pressure. Yeah, that means S stands for the saturation, uh, PS stands for the saturation vapor pressure. Yeah. Uh, now we can plot these functions. Yeah, so here it is plotted for the saturation vapor pressure of water. Yeah, and this works, these plots work for water very well in the range between. 273 Kelvin and 373 Kelvin. Yeah, so it's quite likely that you will see such um, uh, such log pressure versus temperature plots somewhere in literature. Okay, so so far we've essentially limited our considerations to uh, equilibria between different aggregate states. Yeah, uh, however, we know. Uh, that even in the solid state, different phases of one and the same substance can exist. Yeah? Examples are the various modifications of solid sulfur yeah, or of carbon, the modifications of solid nitrogen, yeah, or the modifications of ice, yeah, water ice under high pressures. Right? Uh, but the good news is yeah, that we now can apply all these considerations above to equilibria between different solid phases. All right. So this brings us to the end of this lecture on phase equilibria. 
Next time around, we'll be looking at free energy. See you next time.